Hello and welcome to today's Payoneer webcast. I'm Johnny Steele from the Payoneer team. Our topic today is Payment Services Directive version 2, or PSD2 as it is commonly known. What it is, why it matters, and how it impacts you and us. We're joined today by Mark Dewar, a leading payments lawyer and partner at global law firm DLA Piper. At Payoneer, our mission is to empower millions of businesses all over the world to connect online and grow their global reach. When marketplaces and digital platforms choose Payoneer to power their payments to their pays worldwide, they know that they have selected a fully compliant, secure, and tightly audited payments platform that is recognized and valued by financial auditors around the world. Payoneer has become the market leader at working with marketplaces and enterprises to deliver mass payouts worldwide, trusted today by the world's leading digital brands like Amazon, Airbnb, Google, and Upwork. You've probably been hearing a lot about PSD2 over the past couple of years, it was passed by the European Union back in November 2015, and member states were given two years to include the Directive into national law, which brings us to 2018, the present. In today's webcast, we'll be reviewing the changes brought in by PSD2 and how they impact on marketplaces and digital platforms like you, making payouts to your payees worldwide. So without any further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome Mark Dewar to take us through it. Johnny, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, as Johnny's pointed out, I'm Mark Dewar. I'm a leading uh, payments lawyer and partner in uh, DLA Piper in the IPT, the technology practice specializing in payment service. Um, the purpose of today's session and the aim of the session is to help you understand the consequences of the e European Union's payment services regulation. What I'm hoping to do is to explain and identify why this is of particular relevance now to you as marketplaces and mass payout companies, even if you're not based within the European Union. What I'm also gonna to hope to do is identify possible opportunities that the changes to the European Union regime, which occurred in January of this year, present opportunities to you as mass payout companies and as marketplaces that happen to sit within or outside the European Union doing business either directly with customers in the European Union or with counterparties in the European Union. I'm also going to try and discuss from the perspective of when you're dealing with a counterparty within the European Union, why the changes might change the way in which they seek and have to do business with you. Okay, a snapshot of the payment services regulation. Back in a bit of brief history first, back in 2007, there was the first regulation of payment service providers and provision of payment services, which had previously been an exclusive preserve of financial institutions like banks. The European Union wanted to open up the payments market to make it competitive and to reduce price. It also, wanted in to introduce a level of consumer protection into the payment services market so that consumers could be protected and not abused. This is why, and I will explain the implications of this in more detail later, there is also within the payment services regulation, and this is probably the most important thing that you need to take away from this session, introduced a corporate opt-out. So where there is a contract where the payment service purchaser is a corporate, you can significantly reduce the regulatory obligations imposed by this regime by having a corporate opt-out. So bear that in mind. That was phase one in 2007. Then in phase two in 2015 to 2017, there was the second round of payment services regulation which was introduced, which built on what went before and learned the lessons of the first round. What this round did, and this is what came into force in January of this year, and which is what the precipitation of this talk, is that it introduced really two key things. One, it introduced the concept where a payment service provider provides payments online, so accessing your bank account online, making payments online, things like that. The payment service provider has to allow two, or has to allow two new categories of regulated payment service provider, account information providers, or payment initiators, access to customer accounts. That is really important and may present an opportunity to some of you. Secondly, the opportunity was taken in the increasing age of cybersecurity and cyber attacks 
to increase the level of security surrounding payment service regulation with the introduction by the European Banking Authority of regulatory and technical standards. So that's a brief high level overview. Why is this all going to be relevant to marketplaces and companies that engage in payouts or mass payout? Well, historically, your classic marketplace like an eBay or an Airbnb acted as a commercial agent for both buyers and sellers, tenants and landlords of the transaction. This exemption is narrowing. As a consequence of this, entities that engage in this and provide a payment service will now be regulated. Secondly, there are two new categories of payment services which will now be regulated. And they are a pay those who initiate or commence or encourage a payment by way of a payment initiation service and take personal security credentials of the payer or the payee, as will any service that provides account information services. So that could be an aggregator of information that through an app provides cross account analysis to a potential customer. So those two areas also may well be caught. The other thing that's happening with all of this is that there is a reinforcement of the four ex execution principles in the context of payment services. What I mean by execution principles is simply the payment. There are four principles that the PSD2 now introduces around the payment, and they relate to the charging principle. You can only charge flow through costs, i.e. costs that you incur as a provider. It reinforces the concept of principle preservation, i.e. you cannot eat into the principal amount of the monies that is being transferred. Thirdly, and this is again is important in terms of whether you're regulated or whether you're not regulated, the timing with which you have to implement a payment transaction, by which I mean that if a payer says I want to pay the payee, that money must be transferred and available within T plus one, that's the day of the transaction. Equally, there are key rules, and the fourth key execution principle relating to value dating and availability of funds. And the fifth thing, as I've already mentioned, is that any existing payment service provider that provides payment services online has to give customers payment service, payment initiation providers and account information providers access to their account if those entities have the consumer's or the customer's consent. Okay, that's a bit of a high level overview of why you should be concerned. So, what are payment services? Well, the payment services regulation in Europe applies to any payment service made in any currency if both elements, we say both limbs, that's payer and payee, are within the European Union. And the currencies are euros, pounds sterlings, or Swiss francs, if one limb is in the European Union. So you have, under the old regime up until 2015, both limbs had to be within the European Union. Now, if one of the limbs is in outside the European Union and the transaction is in euros, pounds, sterling, or Swiss francs, then the regime will apply to the European Union element of the transaction. That is really important for entities providing services into the European Union and will explain why they will have obligations imposed on them by the European end of the transaction. Payment services can only be provided within the European Union by a person authorised or registered by the competent regulatory body in that member state. If you're not so authorised, you're committing a criminal offence. Furthermore, an entity that's providing such services within the European Union must comply with the rules relating to pre-contractual information and post-execution information with respect to payment service users, information in respect to charges, and information in respect of authorization and execution of payment transactions. Okay, so what are regulated activities? What activities will be caught? Either if you're operating within the European Union or if your counterparty is within the European Union and they will be seeking to flow those rights down to you if you're providing a counterparty service or a subsidiary service as a third party provider. First up, the key definitional piece is payment account. If you have a payment account, that has the placing, transferring, or withdrawing of funds initiated by a payer or a payee, that will be a regulated activity. If 
That account enables cash to be placed on or withdrawn from the payment account. The payment account is operated. There are an execution of transactions, including transfer of funds, and the account enables receipt or transfer of funds, or there is an enabling of receipt transfer of funds without client payment accounts. This is called money remittance. We now have, post January 2018, two new types of service which are caught, which weren't previously caught, and which will apply to the likes of marketplaces and mass payout companies potentially. The first is a payment initiation service. If you are an entity that initiates the payment of a transaction, and you obtain the personalized security credentials of the payer, then that will be regulated. Equally, as I previously mentioned, if you are providing account information services, information about account or multiple accounts, that will be regulated. And you're doing that within the European Union, you need to be authorized. Equally, if you are executing payment transactions, which are either direct debits, use a payment card or similar, or are credit transfers, that will be regulated. So those are the granular types of transaction. What types of entity are caught? Well, if you're a card issuer, you're likely to be caught. If you're a merchant acquirer, you're likely to be caught. If you're a money remitter, you're likely to be caught. And if you are a payment, if you're engaging in payment transactions that are agreed through a telecommunication, digital or IT device, and payment is made to the MBNO or the tele telecommunication service provider, IT system or network, then that will be regulated and there are new rules around that. If you're an account information service provider or a payment information service provider, you will be caught. Now, critically for marketplaces, in particular like Airbnb and eBay, if you are a commercial agent holding funds, so you take the funds from the payer that's gonna rent the property and you hold them as agent for them and then you release them to the, the payee, either the person that's renting the property to the renter, mm -hmm. then, and you hold funds for both, you will be caught. If you only hold funds for one of those entities, then you will not be caught. This is a change that has been implemented post January 2018. Okay, so that's what's caught, the types of activity and conceptual types of supplier. What is out of scope? Well, the regulations in part two of schedule one have a list of express state, expressly stating what is not caught by the regulation. So if you're in any of these on this page, i.e. cash checks, payment transactions with a payment or security settlement system, intra-group transfers without an intermediary bank or payment service provider intervening, say for balance sheet purposes, if it's an own account transfer between payment service providers, it's a store or a membership card and there is a limitation on the outlets at which it can be used or the goods or services that can be used which is called a closed loop, then it won't be caught, or you're a technical service provider where you don't possess any funds, or you're a payment transaction provider through a telecommunications network to a telecoms IT system or network operator, and the value is within certain limits, or it's a bill payment service and mobile top-up service provider paying debt owing to that provider, you should not be caught. Okay, so if you are caught and you're operating within the European Union, you will need to be authorised, you will need to get registered, and even if you're acting as an agent um, for a third party, say for example, an outfit like DLA Piper is acting as an agent for Payoneer to provide payment service providers, there is a possibility that I could operate under the licence of Payoneer to provide those services, I would need to be registered by Payoneer as its agent. So there are two, there are two activities and two potential categories of registrator. You can be fully registered, reg registered, you need to be authorized, and you could be an agent, thereby relying on your principal's authorization. But the principal needs to notify the regulatory body. There are ongoing obligations once you're registered, which is you've got to maintain a minimum volume of funds in a separate separate segregated account and the amount of that the amount of those funds is relatable and depends on the amount of volume of transactions that you're engaging in you've got to safeguard those funds you have to notify and you have to report annually on your annual turnover on payment services requirements to the local national financial regulators so for example in the uk that would be the financial conduct authority 
Okay. There are, critically, and this is probably the most important piece, pretty rigorous conduct of business requirements if you are regulated as a payment service provider. These, however, bifurcate, they split into two. If you're providing regulated repeat transactions for payment service providers, these are known as framework transactions, i.e. you have an agreement on a regular basis to provide mass payout services, for example, that is a framework transaction, as opposed to a single payment transaction. And not surprisingly, the single level of regulation for single payment transactions is very, very heavily reduced, and you may indeed be able to rely and structure it in a way that takes you outside the regulation. A framework transaction governs the future execution of individual and successive payment transactions, whereas a single payment transactions are one-off. There is no ongoing relationship. As I mentioned in the introduction, a critical thing to think about is whether or not you can rely on the corporate opt-out. This only applies to transactions where the, the, the purchaser of the payment service, either the payer or the payee, is not a consumer, is not a microenterprise, and is not a charity. And in respect to the microenterprise, it's a turnover of a million euros or less. If you can rely on the corporate opt-out, you need to include it contractually in your payment services contract, saying that you're seeking to rely on the corporate opt-out. The significant components are that there are information obligations under the payment services regulation relating to contractual information about how the service is going to be provided, about the execution of the transactions and the timing and the dates and the, and, and the transfer of monies, which you can corporately opt out of. Equally, significant components and the majority of the ongoing obligations that what we call the conduct of business requirements can also be contracted out of. As I mentioned, these cannot be contracted out of with consumers, microenterprises or charities. Delving into more detail in terms of the information requirements, if you haven't exercised the corporate opt-out because you can't or you've forgotten to do it, this should incentivize you to, to, to review this. You will have, if you haven't exercised the corporate opt-out, information requirements in respect of pre-contract. You have to give your customer, your payment service user, pre-contractual information about the nature of the contract. You have to give them a framework contract that details the payment services to be provided, how giving and withdrawing consents will be given, cut-off times, what safeguarding requirements you're going to engage in, and the need for identifying the transaction, exchange rates, and timing. And what happens, for example, in the event of fraud or unattributed transactions. You also need to give payment transaction information in the form of statements. In the framework contract, you can agree the timing, and you may agree to make this information available at least once a month, rather than in respect of each individual transaction and the time of that transaction. So this is important primarily for assessing what is the nature of your relationship with your payment user as a payment service provider if you're regulated, and if it's a business, look at the ability to exercise and contractually document the corporate opt-out. Talk turning briefly to framework contracts. This is assuming you don't have the, the corporate opt-out. There are two other key components which I haven't mentioned, which are termination and variation. A customer may terminate an agreement at any time on one month's notice. However, the payment service provider cannot in, in, introduce or in, levy a termination charge if more than 12 months have passed. Where the contract is of indefinite term, the payment service provider must give at least two months notice to terminate the contract. Equally, in terms of varying the terms of contract, there can be no changes to the terms for the payment services without first giving two months notice. You can introduce unilateral variations, but if the consumer, the payment user, does not agree or does not accept those variations, the contract can terminate immediately. These are pretty important components and necessitate you revisiting what you may or may have not have in place if you're a current European provider, European-based provider, <clears throat> or equally maybe why your European provider, your counterparty, either with you as a non-European union-based payment service provider or with you as a third-party provider, non-regulated to a regulated EU provider, 
This might explain why they are seeking to make changes to your contractual terms to reflect these changes. Okay, rights and obligations of paying service users, which, which if you haven't exercised the corporate opt-out apply, and which should again incentivize you to look at this very closely, it relates to charging. You can only charge for carrying out certain obligations, and you can only charge what reasonably corresponds to your costs. In terms of authorization of the payment transaction, the form and procedure must be given before the contract is entered into. Equally, there are specific rules around refusal and revocation, and there are specific rules around execution and value time of when the funds can be available and when, for example, you're doing an EU sterling EEA currency transaction, when the valuation of the currency exchange will occur. In terms of crediting of accounts, there must be cleared funds within the payee's account within one business day of the payer instructing the transaction. In terms of liability, you must provide a unique identifier. And if there's a defective performance of the payment service, you must restore the account. All of these are capable of being excluded and amended if you exercise the corporate opt-out. Okay, implications. Well, businesses in the payment space should have, certainly within the UK, and I would assess right across Europe, albeit the implementation times of the second payment services directive of 2017 will vary. It should have been implemented in each member state by the 13th of January 2018, but some member states like Germany, um, sorry, some member states like Spain and France have yet to implement. Germany, UK, Holland, and a lot of the Scandinavian countries have already implemented, should and must, as a matter of priority, assess their business operations. They should and must review their systems and operational procedures to, to cross-check against the conduct of business rules and to revisit the exemptions and to revisit whether the corporate opt-out should be obtained. If you're operating within the European Union or you have a branch or subsidiary operating within the European Union, because of the expansion of the natures of services that are caught by the payment services regulations post 13th of January 2018, you need to assess whether you need an authorization as a payment institution. Consider the geographic scope of your business. If you're operating and need to have a branch within the European Union, the passporting requirements remain. You may well be able to set up in one member state and then passport across all the 28 for now until the UK leaves member states your payment services business. The passporting requirements have enhanced and increased, and there's a little more detail that's required, but the primary change to the passporting requirements, which in a sense is the financial regulatory bodies across the members for each member state communicating with each other, the information exchange between those member states has enhanced. You should review your business model, plan and growth. It takes between two to six months sometimes to get a payment services authorization. If you envisage that your business model is such that you want to grow your business across the European Union and it warrants having a, a branch or a business based within the European Union, plan ahead to assess whether that model necessitates you getting an authorization and whether your activities are caught. You need to update your governance arrangements as well to include all this. Obviously, you need to update your contracts with payment service users to ensure that you're complying with the business conduct rules. And reinforcing it again, the most important piece of this, assess whether you can benefit from the corporate opt-out. Once you've done that, and if you can, the most obvious thing to do is remember contractually to document it and agree it with your user. The regulators also are engaged with the payment service providers and the way and the approach of these regulations, because they want them to be future-proofed and taking the UK and Germany as, are as two notable European examples, there is the basic directive, which is then implemented through regulations in each member state. The process by which legislation is promulgated and introduced is a relatively long process in the gestation. So that very much the trend now, and it's encouraged by the regulations and that actually the language of the directive is to allow national regulators to refine <coughs> and continually upgrade the regulation and the directive <coughs> locally through guidance and directional engagement. So look at the local directional engagement. 
At the moment, on the less, latest round on payment services regulations 2017, we have almost zero and very limited court analysis. So reliance, <clears throat> and also that process in itself is quite slow because in most jurisdictions you have three tiers of courts. It's only the second tier where you get an authoritative decision. So most of the interpretive assistance comes from the financial regulators' guidance, like Baffin's guidance and like the Financial Conduct Authority's guidance in Germany and the UK, respectively. So why do you need to be aware? As of January 2018, prior to that date, you may have thought you're outside the regulations. The categories have changed. The conduct of businesses have changed. So your business may now be regulated as the exemptions have changed. So refresh, have a look. There are additional obligations on regulated entities and significant impacts on all businesses if you are caught. You need to check. However, key changes to the law bring new opportunities. For example, as I mentioned, if, if I was a payment service provider providing payments online services, if my, if my customer says to me, I want to use an account information service provider so I can include it on an app, on my iPhone, on my Samsung, whatever it might be, access to all my accounts so this provider can comparatively analyze the costs and charges, I have to provide that information to that, uh, that uh, account service provider unless I cannot get myself comfortable that the level of security that the ASP has is sufficient for me to be comfortable on the GDPR and with security basis to give them that information. That presents a huge opportunity to any regulated ASP to get access to that vital information. Data is the new electricity, is, is, a, is a truism, and it applies particularly to the payment services regulation. As a consequence, the account service providers and the payment initiation providers I firmly believe presents the market with disruptor influence. There is disruption from new entrants, and that's the deliberate thrust and purpose. Part of the idea behind this, apart from consumer protection and enhanced security, is to increase competition and increase diversity of products available to customers. So, implementation dates, we're already there. Um, the new regulation is in place, and we're rocking and rolling. The only one that isn't in place is that in respect of security regulatory and technical standards, particularly around secure customer authentication and system security, under the 2015-2017 Payment Services Directive, the European Banking Authority is authorised to introduce regulatory technical standards on security and secure customer authentication. These aren't going to be, in, they, they, they're in final draft now, they're going to kick in in 2019. So watch this space on that. Okay, the key changes then, <clears throat> if you're familiar with the pre-January 13, 2018 position, are set out in this table. Um, as I've mentioned already, um, at the moment or prior to January 2018, if you had one leg of your tr payment transaction outside the European Union, then the transaction as a whole wasn't caught. That is now changing because if the currency is in sterling euros or Swiss francs and that leg is outside, the transaction is caught. Um, the key changes in terms of marketplace and mass payout companies is that, as I've mentioned, previously you could be a commercial agent for both parties in the transaction and you wouldn't be regulated. Now you can only act and hold funds for one party, um, so marketplaces beware. The other key thing I think for marketplaces and key payout companies, and you can look at this, the rest of this list at your leisure, is that there are new services that are regulated which may catch you, account information services and payment initiation services. If you're providing those from a base in the European Union, then you will be regulated and you need to get authorised. Surcharging, this is critical. This is a critical commercial change since January the 13th, 2018. You can no longer surcharge, and it's been the case in the UK for a while, you can no longer surcharge for the use of the payment instrument. This is effectively now eliminated. You also, and this overlaps with GDPR, have to provide major incident reporting for data breaches. And this is another important thing. This won't come out until 2019 with the RTS guidance. So those are the key changes. There are another four or five, but I leave you to read those at your leisure. Okay. Key opportunities and risks. Well, 
to third party providers such as a payment initiation service provider or account information service provider. Um, do you, if you acquire personal security authentication in either of those instances, in order to access those accounts, you will need, and you carry your business in the European Union, you will need to be authorized. What's going to happen is if you do this, then you will be able to provide payment services and access those accounts. This therefore means we could get new payment brands, new providers of services that provide competition to the established players. There is an introduction which will come through with the RTS guidelines on strong customer authentication. In the UK, this is largely done already, and you, it's basically you need to have two or three authentication factors. It's the three are knowledge, something about the user, possession, something about that they own, like I own a Mini Cooper S Works car, and inheritance, something that only the person knows what color your eyes are, what color your hair is. These two of these three requirements must be asked when and must be systematized so that when a payment service user accesses the service, they can check that they are that individual and they can effectively be authenticated. As I've mentioned, the commercial agents exemption is tightening and only applies to pay or pay fund holders. And this I think is where marketplaces are getting caught. The options to them are to get authorized or get regulated or the easier option is to outsource the payment provision of payment service providers to a regulated entity such as a payoneer. Okay, what are the issues that arise in practice? In reality, there are five. Firstly, you need to interpret you need to, whether or not the law applies to you, and you need to look at the regulatory guidance. And in the UK, that would be the perimeter guidance and associated laws. And the respective surcharges, whilst it's effectively prohibited under the Payment Services Directive, we also have the interchange fee regulations, which overlaps with that, preventing entities from charging and flowing down, or networks or, or car schemes from flowing down interchange fees and others. So you need to read the Payment Services Regulation in the context of local financial regulatory bodies' guidance, but also other related regulations like interchange fees, and also in the context of security and information passage, dare I say it, the general data um, protection regulation. Do you need to be authorised? Check your business model, check it now, whether it needs to be authorised now, and also look at your future business model. What are your plans so that you can future proof and prepare, and you don't reach that point where you've got the implementation of a new project, and you think, hell, I need to get authorised. Check now, plan ahead. Compliance, your terms and conditions which you currently have with your payment service users may well be regulated. They may need to be updated. Look at your product offering and don't forget the surcharging ban. Secure customer authentication. Remember the three components, possession, knowledge, and adherence. Finally, seize the opportunities. This is a real opportunity for new third party providers to provide competition to the existing establishment. Many thanks for your time. Should you have any questions, my details are on the back page and very happy to answer them. Thanks so much, Mark, for the thorough analysis of the changes brought about by PSD2 coming into effect this year and posing the key questions that marketplaces and other companies might making mass payouts need to be asking. Payoneer has earned the trust of the world's leading digital brands in many ways. It includes our ability to help marketplaces connect with and grow in new markets worldwide. Our robust infrastructure and end-to-end -end platform that provides a wide array of solutions beyond payments, including automated tax services, working capital, fraud prevention and risk prevention, and B2B payment collection, are just some of the solutions that we now offer. But perhaps most of all, it's the trust in knowing that Payoneer is regulated around the world and will always be on top of changes to regulation. By leveraging the services of a payments platform like Payoneer, you can be rest assured that any changes to regulation, such as PSD2, will be seamlessly handled. If you have any questions about PSD2 or anything else related to your payment challenges or global growth aspirations, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. Thank you again, Mark. Thank you for watching today. And the details on the screen show our website, our email, and phone number where you can get in touch with us right away. Thank you.